Welcome to another edition of Gain and Retain 365, where our goal is to educate and motivate aspiring entrepreneurs on how to get started. Today we have a very special guest. I will allow her to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Makisha Davis. I'm a realtor with Don Realty and Associates, and I'm also the owner of an investment group called Definitive Properties Group. Um, also, I want to add that I'm a mentor, and so I'm mentoring um, young people on how to invest in properties. We don't want them to wait until they're 40 years old to actually start. But the basis of Definitive Properties Group, um, we do investing, and we talk about building generational wealth through the purchase of tax delinquent properties. So that's our that's our niche. That's our area where we like to play. Okay. How you doing today, Miss Davis? I am doing great. It's a wonderful Sunday. It feels good outside. So, and I'm here. Hey, hey. What an opportunity to share information with your audience. So I'm excited. It's a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, yes. So we're going to dive right into it. Okay. And we're going to talk about these investment properties and these tax delinquent properties. Um, that's a that's a big thing right now. I see yes. it's trending. Yes, everywhere across the U.S., every single state has a process of what they're going to do with their tax delinquent properties. We know taxes was the same. We we're gonna live and die. I mean, we uh, we die and pay taxes. That's that's, that's it forever, that's, right? That's true. That's true. And so, for every state, they depend on the property taxes from real estate. And when those taxes aren't paid, they're not. They're just like the IRS. They're coming. <laughs> right. They're coming for their revenue. And so across, uh, all across the U.S., you were here about tax delinquent properties. Um, for us in Arkansas, we are a tax deed state. Um, if you go to other states, they are a tax lien. So for Arkansas, we are a tax deed state, which means when you buy it, after the redemption period, it's yours. That deed is in your name, and now you are the owner of a property. So it's just that fast. <laughs> and, and other states are tax lien? Tax lien. And, what, and how does that work? And so um, I like to use the analogy. Sometimes when someone has a collection on their credit report, mm -hmm. and it's going to be maybe AT&T was the original creditor, but then ABC Collections bought the debt. And so now there's a new name on your credit report. Right. That's what a tax lien. The state, uh, let's, I think Louisiana, the state of Louisiana, that lien was from the state. But Justin, you're going to go and buy the lien. So now the lien is in your name. Well, you are the lien holder. Okay. So now it was my property. At first I owed the state of Louisiana. Justin came in and bought the lien from the state, so now I owe you. And if I don't pay it, then you get a chance to come in and foreclose, and then you gain ownership of the property. So with tax liens, you have to wait a while <laughs> before you get ownership of the property because okay. it's an actual lien and not the actual deed to the property. Okay. But it's still okay. a great way. Okay. So it's, it's better opportunities in Arkansas as far as acquiring these properties if tax delinquent. Right, because you you're able to get ownership um, much faster. And then we have a very short redemption period. Um, we have 10 business days. Um, and for Louisiana, I know because I'm originally from there, um, theirs is three years. Wow. So there is some time frame. Can I, can I say this real uh -huh. quick? For just anyone listening mm -hmm. that may not know what a tax delinquent property is, right? Yes. Just, if they, just by chance, they don't know. This is a piece of property where the original owner, they failed to pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. And how many how many years before it goes into delinquent? Okay. Um, and again, for everything I'm discussing today, it's for Arkansas because it varies right, right, by right, state. Right, okay? right, right, right. So, but for Arkansas, you it's four consecutive years. Okay. The homeowner, they've received notice, and after four years of non-payment of their taxes, in year five, that property is going to go up for auction. Okay. And now... The homeowner, they have time. They have right up until the moment <laughs> that do. their property is they being called out. Do. The day of <laughs> the auction. Yes. I've seen a lot of them get removed. It yes. was crazy. Yes. Yeah. They have up until that very moment to pay those taxes and regain their property. Okay. So it's not completely lost. And even after you or I, we win that property at the auction, ten days. they still have 10 business days ten to days. come back, you mm. know? So there's, there's still, you know, an opportunity. And I will say... For my business partner and I, for Defender Properties Group, it's just our stance. It's nothing against anyone who chooses to. We don't buy properties that are occupied hmm. at the auction. We find out about it, and we contact them before the auction. Hmm. Because I don't want to have to go through the eviction process right. of having to evict them out. So for us, we know ahead of time that 
this when we're bidding at the auction, we're bidding on a vacant property. Not to say no one will come back to redeem it, right. but the chances of redemption are just smaller because right. it's been vacant forever. So you you give the um, properties of the uh, the owners of the property an opportunity to go ahead and go pay their taxes, or how, how do you do it when you reach out to them? So when I'm reaching occupied? out to them, I'm reaching out for me to buy it as a traditional sale, hmm. and so that means when we go to the closing table, I'm going to be paying their taxes when we close out. Uh, there's a property I'm getting ready to close on. And so I made contact with this owner in September. And it's air property. And that's the other thing I want to point out to the audience. A lot of times the properties that are tax delinquent, it's normally someone has passed away and families didn't keep up the taxes on it. That is the, one of the most common scenarios in the process. So when you're talking to a person, you're probably talking to an heir of the property. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I contacted the heirs. They had no interest in saving the property. They had moved away. They were living their own life. Right. <laughs> they could care less about this mom, property. Mom and dad's house. Right. They live out of state. Probably. And they live out of state, and they they weren't con you know they weren't concerned about it. And so for them, um, I went. I'm going through the normal process, just like you buy a normal house on the MLS. So I'm going through title search, um, and then the taxes were paid at would have been paid at closing. Well, here's the thing, we didn't make it to the closing table before the auction. My property sold at the Pulaski auction. Mm. So that meant that my heir had to go and redeem it back. Okay. But how many days did we have? Ten. We had ten business days. Right. But we we're making a cut. So fortunately, <laughs> she had the money to go and redeem the property back. And then that allowed my contract with them to be reactivated. And now we're smooth selling as normal. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you, you do that. That's not the first time you did that. No. Okay. No, but I like I like it that way because it does two things. One, it allows me to do a full title search. I'm I'm going to the title company, and the title company is doing a full title search for me. So if there are any liens against the property, I'm gonna know about it right then, and we can take care of those liens. The second part is that if I'm getting financing, it allows me to go to the bank. Hmm. When we when we arrive at an auction, oh, you gotta pay for your lease. You gotta pay in full. Yeah. Full amount. They make that announcement before he even starts. Yeah. Yes. So yes. I'm curious. Let's let's make it to the next step. So you arrive at the auction, mm -hmm. right? You have certain parcels that you're bidding on, mm -hmm. right? Um, say for instance, you win one of them. You win one, and you pay for it. You got that owner has ten days to go and redeem it back, right? Yep. So eleventh, the eleventh day comes. It's yours, right? It's yours. What's the next step? So after that, there's still another period, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is called the 90-day litigation mm -hmm. period. And it is, a, but in that time frame, that is between the owners and or a lien holder um, that had rights to that property. That is where they are challenging the commissioner of state lands, saying, hey, that sale was invalid. It never should have occurred. And they have to have a compelling reason. Because okay. again, this is a lawsuit against the state. Right. <laughs> So you're going to have to have a compelling reason as to why that property never should have gone through auction. Okay. But the owner or lien holder, they have 90 days to do that. So I tell those who attend my class, it's called the 100-day wait. Okay. Make plans to wait 100 days you. before you invest too much okay. into the property. Okay. Just do the 100 days, the 100 day wait. Now, how many times have circumstances have you seen where during those 90 days they were challenging the uh, state? Have you seen it work out in their favor and they redeemed it? I have not. And honestly, we have been buying for four years and we have never been challenged at the 90 day litigation period. Okay. There is another period which is optional. Let's talk about we're past the 100 days. Okay. When we're buying these properties, they do not have clear title. Right. So you have to go through a process of quiet title. And quiet title is when now you have an attorney that is going even further saying, hey, is there anyone out here in the world that has interest in this property that Justin just purchased? If you do, you have a certain amount of time to come forward and state whatever your claim may be. And again, this is also a lawsuit. So people are not playing. You know, you're, if you're showing up, we're going to court. Right. <laughs> so you can't just say, oh, yeah, I have interest in your property. No, my attorney is going to carry you to court. So you need to be serious about this. So inside of the quiet title, we have been challenged once. And how long was that period? Um, that varies if you're challenged or not. Um, ours, we're in one now. Um, it was filed in November of 2021, and we're still in quiet title. We have not been challenged yet. 
However, it requires a lot of notifications. So my attorney, she's going back almost as far back as 30 plus years, just like a title company. And she has to serve notice on anyone that shows up in this history. Mm. And so the, the, the notification part takes a little time. But backing up, when we were challenged, it was someone, she was a church member, and she paid the taxes one time <laughs> for this owner who at the time um, when we were buying, it, they had been deceased for like seven years. And she was like, oh, well, I paid the taxes one time and I would like to have my money back. Well, she held up our court process. She wasn't entitled to it, but the judge was not going to sign off because someone said, I have interest in the property. Right. And they responded to the letter from my attorney. So we got to hear her out. We got to hear her out. Okay. So um, once my, my attorney explained to her, okay, ma'am, if you come forth, I mean, my client, they paid X amount of dollars for this property. These were the delinquent taxes. Is this what, you know, this is what your options are. And so she had a discussion with her family, and she was like, oh, I didn't want, she didn't want to deal with it, because that means you have to come to court. Right, <laughs> you right. can't just sit at home and say that this is yours. You have, I mean, it's a, a process. And so she decided that she didn't want to bother with it. And okay. so she signed the waiver, and so then she was no longer part of the case. Okay. So is, is it important to have an attorney when you're doing this? Yes. It is important. Now, um, state, uh, Commissioner of State Lands has two options. They'll say quiet the title, or there's a thing called the 15-year wait, where if you buy your property at a tax sale, and if you decide not to quiet the title, you can do nothing to the title part, and if you wait 15 years, then the property will be not so much automatically, you still have to do something, but that is what is considered to be clear, marketable title. It's 15 years from the day in which you become the owner. You have to pay taxes all 15 years now. <laughs> you, have, you, you have to do good. <laughs> During those 15 years, though, okay, you're not able to sell that property, but you can rent it, right? You can rent it. So you can yes. do renovation and you can rent. Yes. Okay. Now, what yeah. makes it hard for you to sell it is you don't have clear title. Now, if you're selling it to another investor mm. who they're willing to assume that risk, that's different. But to your normal uh, buyer, they're going to want to have title insurance because right, right. they are most likely getting a loan. So uh, you won't be able to sell it to them. But when you're selling to another investor who understands the risk, mm -hmm. I may be willing to assume that risk. Right. Because, like, oh, well, Justin, you've already renovated the property, majority. It looks based on your rent roll that your renter has been paying, you know, on time. And then I, I may decide, okay, I have enough cash on hand that I'll assume that risk. And maybe you only have eight years left right. of the 15. So I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe it's worth me taking that chance. And is that common that you might have individuals who are interested in occupying doors, you know, tenants, and then you have this other uh, individual who's just, he just want to flip. You right. Know? So let me turn it over to this guy who wants tenants. I just want my money now. Right. And on the MLS, I see it sometimes, and it's, it's all about disclosure. And um, the agent will put in the remarks, this property was purchased at a tax sale. It will only be transferred via limited warranty deed. So you know up front what you're, what you're facing. Okay. Okay, I need to find cash. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I need to find cash to buy it. But if it's in a gray area, um, this particular example I'm talking about, it was a vacant lot. And there is some movement in the area. I may be willing to sit on that lot because right, I know, right. okay, you know what? They're slowly developing in this way. Property value going up. Exactly. I need to wait it out anyway mm -hmm. <laughs> right, until right. it makes it here. Yeah. So if the only thing I have to do is call one of my mentees to keep the lawn up mm -hmm. and, you know, I pay my $50 a year in property taxes, yeah. I'm going to assume Justin's remaining seven years. Right. Why not? Exactly. Now, Justin may not get as much, <laughs> but he's still going to make a profit off of it because I am assuming a risk here. Yes. But also what I would do in that case I would order a title search to see what are my risks. Is there someone out there that could come against me um, if I wanted to maybe quiet the title before the eight years are up? So I order my title search. It comes back, okay, you know, no one's on here. I'll assume that risk. So I don't want people to be afraid. They're risk, but don't be afraid. Learn how to mitigate those risks yeah. and get the resources to make you more comfortable with assuming the risk. Right. So... Uh, I'm going to assume that once you make it past 100 days, mm -hmm. you you go straight into quiet, quiet the title. Go straight into quiet title. Quiet title. Mm -hmm. Because you want to go ahead and own, get the deed. Right. Okay. Um, 
Mm-hmm. But not just getting the deed. I want my I want my deed to be have clear title. Okay. So you can do whatever you choose to with the property. Exactly. Sell it, rent it, whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay. But if you go the other route and you wait that 15 years, then you're only going to be able to rent it out or sell to an investor. Sell to another, right. Okay. Okay. Why 15 years, though? Why is that? I'm you not certain why the state choose the 15-year the mark. Um, even within quiet title, <laughs> there's another uh, time frame where someone can come back and what they call set aside the quiet title, and that is like three to five years even after a quiet title has been awarded. So um, there's still some time frame. So I'm not certain why the state has chosen the 15, why, they, why they're so set on 15 years. But for the state, they're saying after 15 years, then we will say that this title is clear and marketable. Okay, okay. And the name of your company again? Definitive Properties Group. Definitive Properties. Okay, so you guys, you attend these auctions, right? Mm-hmm. You go in and you you uh, you acquire certain properties, right? Mm-hmm. And once you acquire them and you made it through the 100 days, you did the quiet title, and it's yours, right? Right. What's the next step? What do you do? So after that, it depends. So for one property that we've purchased, we are going to build on that. We've okay. bought some vacant lots. And so now, um, once we make it, we're past that, we're past our quiet title, now I'm heading out to talk with my builder. So my builder's going to come out, assess the lot, and then I'm heading into uh, the bank trying to get a construction loan. And that's when I'm getting my vacant lot. When we're purchasing a property, and once we're past that phase, most times they're full of junk. So now I'm going in, to, I'm cleaning out the property, I'm getting ready to get my um, contractor bids, and I'm getting ready to rehab it and put it on the market. Now the property that I spoke about earlier where I was able to negotiate with the heirs and I'm buying it outside of the auction, that property is going to be a short term rental for me. So when you buy these properties, you can buy them and sell it to another investor as is. Um, I did one of those. We cleaned it out. We hit the pandemic. We weren't we weren't prepared. That's one of the things I teach in my class is understanding what is my exit strategy. And yes, you can buy the property very inexpensively at the auction, but you need to still have a cushion for those other things to come up. And for us, when the pandemic came, it's like, oh my God, we're going to have all this inventory. How is the pandemic going to turn out? We're spending money. We're paying taxes. We're keeping up lawn care. People are breaking into the property. We're constantly having to replace windows. At what point are we going to exceed our cushion? So as a result of that, we said, okay, let's go ahead and sell our inventory that we have. And so we sold the property as is to another investor. Mm. And so now he's there renovating the property, and he's going to put it on the market. Okay. We wish we could go back. Right, right, right. We wish, we wish, that, we, we wish that we could go back. Um, something else about vacant lots. One of my... I don't refer to my students as students. I refer to them as wealth builders. So one of the wealth builders from my January class I just had, um, they purchased a lot, and she's going to sit on it because within a half-mile radius, they are doing new development, and their home is going for $300,000. Mm. So, and Smart. they paid like $7,500 for the lot. Smart. She's yeah. just going to sit on I'm it. Sit. She is just going to yeah. So she's doing nothing with it. However, now she does not plan to build on it, but she will be able to sell that to another builder. That's neat. I have two contractor clients, and they're not always able to attend the auctions. So sometimes I will attend, and I may bid on the property that they want, and then I just turn around and sell it to them. They understand the risk. They would have bid it on the property if they were able to be there. Right, right. So builders, they're out building homes. Right. Especially if it's one that has a smaller team. They don't have anyone to go to the auction for them. Justin, you go to the auction and you are able to get a lot in a community that they're developing, call that builder. I have a lot here and you tell them, especially if they are familiar with tax and winkler properties, they understand the risk already. Mm-hmm. And if they, if it's going to take them some time to get to the development of the lot, they can afford to wait. And uh, uh, obviously your price is not going to be their price. Not at all. Uh, so what does the <laughs> profit margin look like when you do that? So now, because they are assuming the risk mm-hmm. and that there may be some liens and some other, you know, other things involved with it, I'm going to do a market analysis to tell me how much would this lot be worth if those things were not in place. Okay. And then between what I paid for and what it would be if liens were not an issue, I'm going to place somewhere in the middle. Okay. But it's still, still nice for you. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned earlier that you have to um, take care of the lawn care, uh, board up windows. You might have to worry about people breaking in. Yes. Because you have to maintain these properties after you acquire them if yes. you're not going straight in and do exactly. rehab. Exactly, yes. Because it's certain ordinances and, mm -hmm. and codes and stuff right. and, and the city limits. Yes. And I will share, for our very first property, um, you hear the term, buy the block. Oh, we bought the block. We literally bought the, this one block in Little Rock. Uh, there were four lots. And so our plan was to uh, build some single-family homes on it. And it was an area in the city of Little Rock where the city had some um, grant funds that they were pouring into the community trying to revitalize the area. So we're like, oh, great, we bought the block. So we buy it, and we come over <laughs> one day, and the city had a nice yellow sign in one, on one of the lots. And we're like, oh, my goodness. So now we're trying to find someone that will know a total of five lots is what we had all together. So it's like, we're going to find somebody to know all five. And it was, they were deep lots and nice size. So before you know it, we held on to it for two, excuse me, for two years. We paid $3,200 for the block. Mm. In a two year time, we were inching up to having that amount of expenses and from lawn care. From lawn care. Yeah, I can believe it. So <laughs> it's like, where are my little mentees that have cars? Because this is what I need right now. So, but for us, we were two women. We were out here. We're like, we're not going to. We don't have a lawn more, even if we wanted to do it. Right. So we had to contract out with someone else to keep that up for us. And so, again, our two-year time frame hit right at the pandemic. So we're like, this is costing us. Right. And if we continue to hold on to it, at some point, we're going to exceed our profit margin. And we're going to just break even right. by the time we get ready to sell it. So... We decided to sell it, um, but we're thankful, just in case this is the investor is listening, we sold it to another investor, and guess what? He's now developing on it. Okay. So is this the time it was off for you time. guys? Because mm -hmm. it was right before the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know you mentioned that there were some grants available for mm -hmm. de developing with urban communities? Yes. Okay. And that is what slowed, even within the two-year time frame, that's what slowed us down, because when we contacted the city, it was like, oh, we're out of grants. Mm. So it was like, oh... Well, what else can we do that will attract someone to live here? And I want also want to say that was our first property that we bought. So we're, I mean, like we're trying to find our way. Right. <laughs> and the plan that we had, it wasn't going to work. And then we ran into the pandemic and we're like, what? And so now post pandemic, we're sitting on it. Right. Anything we buy, we're holding on to it. So, um, it, how how do you go about finding those grants for developing those type of communities? So, for that is where you really have to tap into um, whatever city you're, you're buying in, um, into the that particular the zoning uh, the zoning and the uh, housing department is going to their going to their office, saying, "Hey, what type of plans do you have for in any part?" Of the city mm -hmm. is there any type of development that the city is going to be doing are you looking for people to partner with the city the city has housing and they have homes available but they don't want to be a real estate they don't want to be a real estate office so right. if they can partner with someone to help them in developing those areas go and have that conversation with them now for me um, because I'm also maintaining a full-time job I am a internet stalker okay. Okay. <laughs> so for the city of Little Rock on their website, they have a section where they give you all of their development plans, and they're talking about what's happening in the city. Also, they have their meeting minutes where you can see where they've had a discussion about what they're going to be doing in the city. Read those minutes. And because the auctions happen once a year, read the minutes in 2022 and be prepared to be it in 2023. Okay. So prep yourself for when that time comes. Okay. So you definitely got to do your own due diligence. Yes. Okay makes a lot of sense yeah, so this most definitely so how successful has your company been as far as acquiring rehabbing and putting it back out on the market we have been blessed in that we started in 2018 okay um, we all in the beginning we would go in with seven properties that we had our eyes on the very first year we walked away with four of them okay um, the second year we went in with the same seven and we walked away with three one of them was redeemed. Um, the other one was, I have in my class, I go over all the case studies of everything that we learned. But remember I talked about the 10 business day redemption period? Mm -hmm. 
one of my properties was burned on day 10. Really? It was before 11.59 p.m. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. You think that was personal? <laughs> The owner of the property, you know what? they torched I, it. I'm t I don't know. My feelings have been. It's more than a coincidence. You know, I was like, do what? You said 11:59. Well, that's the cutoff. That's the time frame. Yeah, yeah But yeah, it yeah. happened before then. Okay. But I didn't know about it, so I go over after my 10 business days have passed. I'm going over with the locksmith so that we can change the locks. And when we get there, my business partner she arrived before I did. She's like, uh, "Did you know this property was burned?" I was like, what? Let me tell you, I'm adamant. I drive by weeks before the auction. I'm driving by the night before the auction. I'm driving by the morning of. I'm taking pictures. Okay. So I would have known I like that. if it was on fire. Yeah. I mean, if it had been burned. I would have right. known that. Right. So I was like, what? Another thing, God is my business partner. We pray over every list before we go in to bid. So it's like, okay. God, you, you could have told me no. I mean, like, I didn't have to have it. So why did this happen? Right. But anyway, so I was like, how did I miss this? I was beating myself up. You know, I was like, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? So I go in to get the uh, report from the fire department, and I saw that it happened after I bought it. Mm. So now I was like, the enemy's trying to get me. I'm like, why did you do this? I still don't know why it happened. So was that one of the one like a loss you had to just take on the chin? Guess what? God, God had me covered. I was able to write a letter to the commissioner explaining what happened and how I wasn't able to protect my company because that's not my property during the 10 business days. Right, right. So what insurance policy? You got to find an insurance company willing to take a risk for something that's really not yours. That's key, y'all. Make sure y'all take notes on that. Yeah, she make sure said. you come to class. Yeah, you're gonna, you get yeah. all the juice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But because I was not able to protect the asset, it was a loss. But I wrote a letter to the commissioner explaining my due diligence. Right. I, you know, what all I could do. I had my pictures that I took before the auction um, and Te everything. Technically, you weren't reliable for that. Nope. No, not at all. Now, if it had been a day 11, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. it's on you, you know. <clears throat> uh, but before I actually said, okay, I'm going to write a letter to the state. Because I'm still, this is now our second year. So we're learning. And so I didn't know that was an option. I was like, okay, it's just mine. So now I have to do something with it. So I called other investors that were more experienced um, dealing with fire damage. Fire damage is not bad. I want to make sure <laughs> everyone knows that. There are some investors, they know what to do. Right. Contractors, it doesn't cost them as much to do a renovation on a burn property. So I went looking for investors that advertise, you know, they were talking on Facebook that that was the type of property that they bought. So I tried to sell it to one of them. Mm -hmm. But again, out of fear, I'm like, okay, I'm still holding on to this property. Now I'm having to mow the yard. Now the city has gone over and put a red tag on the property. So now it's attached to what my business name. Mm -hmm. So now I have risk because if someone goes on to the property and they get hurt, it's in my business right, name. Right, right. So I was like, I have to move the risk away from my business, even if that meant I was going to take a loss. I needed to move the risk away from my business. So my last part was, okay, I'm going to send a letter to the commissioner and just say this is what happened. And the commissioner was in my favor, and they reversed the sale. Refunded you. And refunded me. Yeah, that's good. All the time. Mm. And I tell anyone I meet, that is the reason why in my class I share my case studies because I tell them for every loss, break-even moment, break-even point or whatever I had, it's a way for me to educate the next person. You're not going to have that experience because I just told you what to do. Right, right, right. Yep. So that, that's <clears> going <throat> to save you a headache. <laughs> mm -hmm. You you don't have to worry about trying to find someone else to buy it. You know exactly what to do. Just write that letter. Yeah, write a letter. Mm. Take pictures before you go. Okay. So that you have proof that this is what it looked like when before. I bought it. Before. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got you. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm curious, Ms. Davis, are you, um, you is your company holding doors? Are you guys uh, renting to tenants? Or are you just you reselling? Are you doing both? We are reselling. For the first three years, our goal was let's build capital. Okay. So we were buying properties strictly for the purpose of selling them. After, remember, the pandemic came, we were like, what? So at that point, we were like, okay, every idea we had, <laughs> let's go ahead and sell them and build capital. Even going into our third year. It was the same goal. Let's buy properties that we can sell back out, and most of them are going to be sold as is, just so that we can build capital. Now our focus is we're buying vacant lots mm -hmm. that we can do new construction on. And 
one topic I encourage anyone to do when you're buying the tax delinquent properties is pay attention to the market. Right now, it's a seller's market. We have more buyers than we do properties. Buyers are ready to buy. Yeah, New construction sells really fast. So if I can create properties for others to buy, and I know that it's a seller's market, my property shouldn't be on there very long. Not at all. Are you focused on single family homes? Single family homes. Mm -hmm. Now, the one that we're closing on here in another uh, next week, that was going to be a short term rental. And that would be our first door that we're going to actually hold. Okay. But the other three, we have three lots that are um, going through their quiet title. And once that's done, those homes are going to be uh, new construction. Okay. So that door that you're getting ready to hold on to, is you see a lot of potential there? Oh, yeah. Okay. We're, we're close to a hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. We're, we're, clo we're close to a hospital. Uh, we're close to some shopping centers. So, yeah. So what advice would you give anyone listening that wants to get into this industry? What would you, what would you tell them? The first thing I would tell them <clears throat> is to get into the atmosphere where it's happening. Even if you just go and you attend an auction for observation. In buying tax delinquent properties, you have to brush off the fear part. Yes, you have to show up with all cash. Yes, there's a risk in spending all cash and you get to this property and the property has more problems than you imagine. Right. But that's going to happen. So relax your shoulders and relax and just go into the atmosphere where it's happening. One, so you can remove the fear part. Number two, learn how to do your due diligence. Learn how to do that research about the property um, and have a strategy for what am I going to do once I own this property? What's my exit strategy? Um, what am I going to do with it? And then start partnering with others. Funding is another something that stops people from attending the auction True. because you have to pay for it up front. Well, if I come to you and I say, well, Justin, um, the uh, tax properties in Arkansas is just blah, blah, blah. Here are a few properties I've taken a look at. I've done some research on them. I've attended an auction and kind of see how it go. Um, would you be interested in partnering with me? If I'm delivering to you, my work, my research, you may be more prone to work with me and we put our funding together. True. Especially if we don't plan on holding it together for very right, long. Right, right. Say, oh yeah, Makisha, I'll invest with you. And I say, okay, well Justin, um, I have a builder that's wanting to build an XYZ community. We're gonna speak with him and we're gonna sell it back off to him. Right, right. He understands the risk already. Exactly. And so you and I, we just partnered. We have an exit strategy. We, sh we already know what our risks are. Mm -hmm. And now we're building generational wealth. Right, right. And so now you and I, we are building up our capital funds so that when we go to another auction and we're wanting to buy a property that we're going to hold, mm -hmm. we have more capital to play yes, with. Yes, and that's important. Mm -hmm. Very important. And we're stronger, we stronger together, strength in yes. numbers. I've yes. seen that at the first auction that I attended. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was an investment group and buying everything. Yes. It was yes. crazy. I've always had um, a business partner when um, bidding at the auctions. But also, I have a business partner. We buy some properties together, mm -hmm. and then I have some that I buy on my own. Sure. But when we're going in there together, mm -hmm. that's that's two pots. Right. You, you can play a little. You can play a little bit more. Most definitely. So I encourage anyone, <laughs> don't be afraid to share that experience with a partner. Now, you mentioned something a minute ago. It was like music to my ears. You said generational wealth. How important is it for our people to acquire real estate to build generational wealth? Oh, my goodness. Real estate is never going to leave. We walk into Walmart. That's real estate. The building I'm sitting in with you, it's real estate. That will never, ever die. The value goes up and down, right. but it's never going to die. Um, I shared with you earlier that actually what prompted me to start back with investing is because I was at work. My director comes in. She says, hey, um, the funding that we have for your position uh, is it's federal funding. Depending on how things go, it may be in jeopardy. We may have to move you around. So at that point, my financial well-being was in the hands of one person. And you never want that. One person had complete control of that. And so I was like, okay, you have to do something else. Well, for our families and our generations to come, 
I don't want them to have that conversation. Mm. If someone walks in and they say to, I don't have children, but I have a niece and nephew. Uh, if they walk into one of them, they have that conversation. I want them to say, okay. Right. And it, uh, that's it. Just, it's, it's okay. Fine. Don't leave. You don't yeah. have to leave the job if you enjoy it. But I want you, I don't want you to have to have that weight right. on your shoulder. Right. And again, we, if we don't own our own properties, we are making someone else comfortable. That's it. When we're renting, the landlord, they're comfortable. True enough, this pandemic was a shake for some landlords. So what happened? The government Bailed provided. Yeah. yeah. Had the, uh, what was the uh, moratorium? Yeah, we had the moratorium. And now um, the government's providing funding to where if the tenant applies for the funds, then the landlord is able to receive some of that money back. Mm. It's not perfect, but the fact remains, real estate is so important that even the government <laughs> provides funding for landlords and owners to be able to keep that asset. Right. And when I go and when we go to the bank, when I go to the bank and I'm presenting my portfolio to get funding, they want to know about my asset. Because I have other properties, I look different than the one that does not. Right. And that's leverage. Mm -hmm. You're leveraging. Mm. The equity in the property that I'm buying, it has a nice amount of equity in there. I will be able to use a home equity line of credit to go and buy more property. An apartment, I just have it. <laughs> Someone else's home that I'm renting, they have the equity. I don't. Mm. So once we learn it, and then we teach our families how to keep it. Because right. again, we're talking about tax delinquent properties. Right, right. That property was once someone's family's wealth. Exactly. And the family didn't understand or there wasn't a desire to keep it. So in building generational wealth, we also have to teach our families how to maintain that wealth. And I mentioned about being a mentor. That is what I'm teaching my mentees. So, and I teach it to them now. I'm not going to wait till I have 200 doors and I'm trying to reach back. No, no, no. We're learning. They're walking right alongside me. Mm -hmm. I have a 10th grader. That's my intern. Really? I am so excited for him. He comes from a family that has a rental property, and um, he knows what he wants. Oh. He's in my class next month. I'm excited for him, too, and I don't even know him. But to be inspired and engaged mm -hmm. in this realm at, yes. in the 10th grade? Yes, that's, and he became my intern. He um, worked on one of my research projects. He's learning all of it. He knows how to research the property. I mean, he he's getting all of it in there. He will come to me. Um, he'll be with me with my contractor when we're rehabbing the property. So he's going to know what to expect from a contractor. So when he graduates from high school, mm -hmm. man, I'm so excited for him. Wow. I'm excited for him. So our children are not too young to start having the conversation. Um, if anyone were to go to my Facebook page, you'll see my little niece at the time. She was three. She's standing in front of one of the for sale signs for one of the properties that we sold. She understands what it means when I say it's her house. She, she knows what it means. Mm -hmm. She gets it. So you can't assume that they don't understand. Start having that conversation. Start planting those seeds um, and, and to them. And then once they actually begin to see you and they the older they get, they're going to remember those conversations. Right. And so building wealth, and it won't be a matter of arrogance. It's a matter of responsibility. Because, yes, we may have rental properties and we may have a tenant, but that home is still someone's safe place. Right. I just happen to be the one providing it Definitely. to you. Yeah. So there's still yeah. value in those that are renting. But for those that become the owner of that property, that creates something for your family individually. Mm -hmm. And you're still providing a service. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I'm curious. Um, and I heard you say once you reach 200 doors, I'm curious. What are your dreams, goals, and aspirations for the future? So for me, <clears throat> I am actually doing real estate investing because I want to run a nonprofit. So it's to replace my income. So I will be this magic number. I call it my make it happen number. And so that number adjusts every year. So I have a make it happen number. And when I reach that number, then that is when I will transition away from being hardcore investing, but being able to start running that nonprofit where I am teaching other young people, not only for real estate investing, but just life in general. I've been a mentor in the Little Rock School District uh, since 05. All of my babies are adults now. And so now I'm teaching them. So for me, it's getting to a place to where I can sleep in if I want to and all of my expenses are covered. I can run back and forth to Louisiana to take care of my mother that's ill. 
without having to put in a notice saying, can I take, use my sick leave? Mm -hmm. So um, that reaching point for me, it moves from year to year to year, but the goal is to where my income is coming from real estate and I don't have to worry about clocking in anywhere if I don't choose to. <laughs> I'm not against it, <laughs> right, right. but if I don't choose to, then I have that as an option. I got you. I got you. So the number of doors will vary. Honestly, I don't want the 200 door part. Um, if I can get away with, you know, under 100 doors, really under 50 doors to reach that make it happen <laughs> number, right. that would be my preference. Right. Uh, I'm not too big on having a, a, a lot of doors. I will definitely have a property manager, right. but still, uh, I don't know if I'm really too focused on the number of doors. As long as I have the doors that can reach that make it happen number, then that is what my goal is. Okay. So we're just looking for passive income mm -hmm. to create the financial freedom. Yes. That's the goal. And that should be everybody's goal. Yes. Even say, I would never speak against someone leaving their job. I would never, ever do that because we need nurses. Um, we need the school teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need those that are actually, you know, working uh, in different places. But being able to have that additional income to where if life should shift, your financial well-being doesn't shake you more than the situation. Mm -hmm. It is so hard to have a situation to shake you and your finances too. That's a lot. Right. That's a lot for someone to try to maintain. So um, I encourage people to try. Get started. Money, yes, you need it <laughs> for investing. But you probably remember from the tax sale, some of those properties sold for $500. They did. Yep. Some had an opening bid of 200 I think the was $238. So some of those properties have an opening bid that's on the low, you know, on the lower end. Most times that's going to mean it's a vacant lot or at least it was maybe a property and now the dwelling has been removed. But buying that lot and selling it to someone else, you pay 200 for it. You may can sell it for, you know, three or four thousand dollars right, more. Right, right, right. And I noticed that because we looked, we went out and kind of did our homework. We've seen some of these empty lots were um, right beside, you know, nice, decent houses. Mm -hmm. Right. And the owners of the house were like using that lot. Yes. And I mean, what is it to just knock on the door and say, hey, man, we just acquired this lot and we're curious if you want to want to purchase it before we decide to do something with it. Yeah. <laughs> One of the wealth builders from my January class, that is what she did. Mm -hmm. She tried to talk with the owner that owned the lot right beside her house. He didn't want to budge. So she went to the auction. So she bought it. Now, she really wants it for her purposes. Right, right. But if he comes back, she can sell him his lot back. And she's going to, of course, she was selling for more than what she paid exactly. for it. Um, a few other things I want people to think about. Um, we are moving now to where we have the mobile um, food industry. You know, now, and you see a lot of mobile food trucks. Some are parked at a business parking lot, or maybe there is actually um, a food truck area. Check and see how many of those lots are close to a commercial zone. Maybe it's too small for a house, but it's not too small for a mobile truck. Mm. a mobile food truck mm. you yeah. have it you set it up and then you lease that space out to yeah. that business yeah that's an idea we had for sure yeah. mm -hmm. we yeah. have tiny homes the whole tiny home movement is happening Ooh, we did. and again maybe it's not large enough for a normal single family home but it's large enough that you can put a tiny home on there right. um same thing with the even mobile homes mobile homes um they are considered mobile property but when the taxes are delinquent, they're moved over to real property. There was once a mobile home. It was already set up in a mobile home park, so you didn't have to worry about moving it. And that one had an opening bid of $1,200. Now, mobile homes, so you, you can go in and repair them, and their value for rent is almost as much as that as a, a single-family home, a dwelling that's fixed. Wow. And that was just up the street here in Jacksonville. So you don't have to worry about moving it anywhere. It was already in place. And it went for, I think, $1,600. Mm, Do you realize how $1,600? I don't know what the inside may have been. It may have been. Even at, you know, five or $600 in rent, at the end of the year, you have made back <laughs> yeah. all of that. Yeah. You're renting the lot space, but that's included in your rent right. to, the, to the person. And so, and then that community, the mobile home community, they have a property that has been restored. It's no longer an eyesore to the community. 
you probably can work out something with the mobile home park owner to give you some time to renovate it and bring it up before you even start paying lot rent. Because they, they don't want their mobile home park looking like that. No, no, no. And when you build that relationship with them, they may let you know of others that are coming up. Before you know it, so soon you own the whole mobile home park. Mm. So there are, there are many opportunities. And so we've started tapping into the vacant lots because we're doing the new construction. Okay. And we're doing new construction because people need houses to they buy. They do. They do. It's a high market. Yes. So I'm curious, what, um, what do you have coming up in the near future? Uh, anything that you may want to share with the audience listening? So on April 9th, I'm going to be hosting my second um, tax deed workshop. So I just held one in January. Okay. I'd like to hold the workshops before the auction season starts. Okay. But I had some wealth builders. They attended in January. They went out. They started performing. And so they started telling other people about it, and I had more interest. So now I'm hosting another one on April 9th. I'm hosting that one in April because we have some of our, our larger counties are still left. You still have Jefferson County. They're coming up April 19th. You still have Faulkner County. You still have Washington County. You still have Saline County. So you still have some of those larger counties that have some high property value properties. You still have an opportunity. Okay. So I want people to, to, if they have an interest in buying tax delinquent properties, and not just for those counties. I mean any county. The information that I'm sharing, once you get it, you can rinse and repeat. There is no upsell on my class. Um, my class is taught in five parts. I teach you about property taxes. Why is tax delinquent properties a thing? I teach that because I don't want you to repeat it and have your right. property back on the list right, right, right. <laughs> four years later. Also, and then I teach about the auction day, um, the registration, how to reach your, comp your competition, um, how to actually uh, register when you have multiple businesses and you want to buy property in multiple business names, you need to have a certain kind of, not a certain, but you need to register a certain kind of way for that. So I go over um, all the things you need for auction day. Then I go over my case studies. I'm sharing with you everything, <laughs> every mistake that we've made, um, the, the losses and the wins that we've had, that's covered in the case studies. Then we're going to go over the pre-auction day. I do that last because that's the most in-depth part of the course. There I'm going over how to research the liens against the property, how to research any liens against the person, how to skip trace the owner. As I mentioned for the property that I'm closing on this week, I found the heirs. Remember, the owner was deceased. Mm -hmm. So I had to go find their children. Mm -hmm. One of the children lived out of state, and the other one, she lived, and they, she hadn't talked to her sibling in years. So you have to be able to find all players. Mm -hmm. So I go over skip tracing, um, how to read the property maps. Sometimes you will get a property. It has one property address, but that address may have multiple parcels. You may think you're bidding on the entire address, and you're not. You may only be bidding on one part. Mm. If the little bitty piece that the owner wasn't concerned about anybody buying anyway, so they weren't paying taxes. Well, you drive by, and you say, oh, that's house 123 Acorn Street. Oh, that's it. And you see a nice home there, and you're getting ready to bid on it, and it's not. It's the corner over there. Wow. And you thought that was 123 Acorn because the legal description had 123 Acorn, but you need to pay attention to the parcel number. So you got to learn how to read that legal description. And I go over that in class as well. Mm. Some valuable information. Very valuable. Coming up on April the April 9th. April 9th. And it's actually going to be a hybrid. I realize we're still in a pandemic. And some people, you know, they like to do things virtually. So it's going to be in person and virtual. And the class is from 930 to 330. Uh, the sponsor for that class is Ms. Carmen Dawson with ProLand Title. It's also good to get your title company <laughs> when you're buying tax delinquent property. So ProLand Title is my guest speaker. So she will be there to talk about what a title company is looking for when they are going to insure tax delinquent properties. So she's providing lunch for us. So hey, we're going to feed you. <laughs> we're going to give you education. And that class, I'm going to tell you, for the amount of information you get, and I just mentioned you can buy a property for $238. My class is $97. Can't beat it. And it's not an upsell. And what you learn in my class, it's the same information year after year because I'm teaching you the rules and regulations from the commissioner of state lands. I'm not writing the law. 
I'm just further explaining the law to you. So if the law doesn't change, what you learn in my class doesn't change either. Mm. And then in addition to that, um, whomever attends my class, I add them to the private Facebook group where as I'm buying more properties and I'm gaining more case studies, you get that information inside the private group. Can't beat that. That's no. priceless. That's priceless. Like, Y'all need to tune in, tap in, get registered for this class ASAP. Yes. ASAP. April 9th. Um, the reg if you go, uh, it's dpgtaxclass.eventbrite.com is where you can register. And then also you can find it on Defendant Properties Group okay. on the Facebook on page. Facebook? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. What other social media information would you like to give? Um, on Instagram, you can find us under my name, Lakeisha Davis. Um, and if you search for the hashtag Definitive Properties Group, you'll find us there too. And then on Facebook, it's going to be under Definitive Properties Group. And also, you can find me under Don Realty and Associates, and that's also um, on Facebook as well. Okay, okay. Any any last words? Anything you want to share? Yeah, I just I want to say to everyone, whatever you're wanting to do, especially as it relates to real estate, just start being in the atmosphere where those conversations are happening. You can sit at home, you can dwell on, I want to start, I heard, or I'm familiar with it. No, start showing up in the atmosphere where it's happening. And at Defenders Properties Group, we are going to share our experiences, and we are a great, we are a loving atmosphere. We are a faith atmosphere. Again, as I mentioned, God is our business partner. <laughs> so he has been guiding us, and so we would love to have you be a part of our family um, dealing with tax delinquent properties. Also, I am a short sale and foreclosure specialist. So as foreclosures begin to roll out here, um, once we move past the pandemic, not only do you get tax delinquent, you're going to get foreclosure from me as well. Wow. Okay. And with foreclosure, I help both sides. And in both experiences, I'm trying to help the homeowner keep their property. Right, right. I don't want to evict you. I want you to keep your, that's your wealth. Right. And I want you to keep it. But if you're not able to keep it, then I want to help you still be able to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm going to be doing with foreclosures, helping families save it. If they choose it, that doesn't work for them. And then, Justin, I want to be able to partner with investors like yourself. I can call you and say, hey, Justin, I have this family coming up. It's a tight timeline. We have to get this sold within a certain time. Is this something that you have interest in? And with me knowing that you are part of our family, I feel comfortable having you be the one to purchase that property. I love it. Yeah. So show up in the atmosphere. Yeah. Just be a part of the atmosphere. That's what's up. Get involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we appreciate you for taking time out your schedule. To yes. Well, thank you for yeah. having us. I, you know, um, I'm on social media, but a lot of times I'm passing and I hear people, you know, you hear just you kind of eavesdrop in other people's conversation. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, there's another way to get it done. And I don't think a lot of us really understand how tax delinquent properties, I mean, we, by the time it happens, like, oh, I missed it. Okay, but guess the other part. In-persons happen once a year. Post-auction are 24-7. You still have time to go buy other properties. And the process still works the same. Mm. So you're never, you never missed an opportunity. Right. You just have to learn how to go find it. And that's what we're going to teach you. That's it. How, how, to, how to find those opportunities. I love it. I love it. Hey, y'all tap in. Sign up for the class. Go get the information. It's going to be even more gems released. So yes. <laughs> tune in. We thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Wake up. Wake up.